morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome everybody out to Body of Blood Ministries. Uh, this morning I'm reading from uh, Galatians 2 and 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. As I was reading this scripture and thinking about this weekend being, you know, the 4th of July, Independence Weekend, and thinking about the word freedom, you know, and the freedoms we have in Christ, it's only because he gave himself for me and for you that we have that freedom now, that freedom from sin and that freedom from death. So this weekend is where, you know, we're celebrating. Keep that on your hearts and minds that, you know, Jesus came down and gave himself out of the love that he has for each and every one of us. That way we would have that freedom. Lord God, we're just so thankful to be here today. We're thankful for your love and your grace and your mercies that are brand new each day. Thank you for the freedom that we have to come and, and hear your word and, and worship you in spirit and truth, God. Thank you for that precious blood that you spilled on that, that cross on Calvary, God. All out of the love that you have for each and every one of us. You knew that some might reject you, God, but you, you gave it all anyways. Just so we could have that that relationship and be reconciled with the Father. We welcome your Holy Spirit to have its way in this service today, God. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, I pray that they would give their life to you, Lord, as a sacrifice. If there's anybody here today that needs healing, I pray, Lord, that you would meet their needs, meet the needs of the broken heart of God. We pray for your peace and your grace on all your people, Lord. We give you all the glory. Your will be done. Jesus' name, amen. 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 How is everybody? Bless. Bless. We got one. It's really excited. Yes, we are blessed. Pastor Hagee used to say, uh, "Too blessed to be stressed." Amen. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Are we ready to sing a little bit? Yes. Yeah. Well, let's stand up and praise the Lord. Yeah. Amen. 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 Amen.
walking in liberty. You know, the greatest freedom we have is in Christ. And it's good to be living in the United States. And I love it. I love, I love my country and what it stands for most of the time. But my true freedom comes from Christ. And I don't have to be in bondage again. That's a good thing.
Let's just get real here, man. Great yeah. middle God. Yeah. Oh, he's a man of great wow. um, right. A little difference. A little bit more humility there. <laughs>
This is the time where we do our offering, and uh, as we've discussed many times, you should already know what it is that you are offering to the Lord this week. Uh, you know what you've been blessed with, you know what you've received, you know what He's uh, laying on your heart to uh, put back into His kingdom if you're you're truly in communication with Him, if you're if you're praying and, and you're, you're 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 in tune with the Holy Spirit. There shouldn't be a question when you come in here. It shouldn't be. Uh, just a, a fumbling through a pocketbook because uh, it's more than, or, or your wallet uh, per se. Uh, it, it's much more than that. Um, you know that is that is part of it, but the, the biggest part of it is is what is it that He's given you spiritually? What is it that He's given you mentally? What is it that He's given you uh, even physically? You know, uh, what is it that He's given you that He needs you to put back into His kingdom? Um, because it's not just yoked to our dollars, it's, it's yoked to our hearts. So um, keep that in mind. And, and as I said, you know, we, this is something that we should get better at each week. Like we're not asking for perfection, right? But at some point during the week, it should trigger, you know, hold on, I'm receiving all these blessings. What am I supposed to do with these blessings? And uh, if, if we start thinking that way, when we come in here on Sunday and we, we do this offering, we're like, I already know what I'm supposed to do. This is it, Lord. And uh, so so be mindful of the blessings that you've received and, and how you're supposed to use them. You know, I, I do feel like as a congregation and as a people, we are becoming more self-aware and becoming more aware of the blessings that he has given us. And, and I do feel like, I, as a matter of fact, I know for a fact that, uh, that, that more people in this room are acknowledging the blessings that they've received from God each week. I, I know that from conversations that I have. Uh, prayer requests that I receive and just, just you know, an overall observation of, of the people now that we, we acknowledge that we're receiving these blessings, the next question is, what do I do with them? 
You know, if you're given something and yet you don't know what to do with it, it's really kind of useless. You, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not calling the blessings of the Lord useless. So don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is, if we don't use them properly, uh, we're, we can't glorify Him properly. And because the reason we're given those blessings is not just to to enrich our lives. The, the reason that we're given those blessings is so that we can glorify the Lord with our lives and with the blessings that He's given us. So if we don't know how to use them, it's impossible to glorify properly. Therefore. Jesus. So, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to, to return uh, the, the gifts that you've given us into your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we thank you for, for bestowing upon us such great and, and wonderful gifts. Gifts that we would never be able to obtain ourselves. Gifts of knowledge, gifts of love, gifts of forgiveness, gifts of understanding. Uh, gifts of, of, of yourself, Lord. Lord, we, we pray that we take these things and that we put them into your kingdom with a cheerful heart and with a with a, a, a conscious mind, that we do not enter these things uh, blindly, Lord, but we, we come with an understanding of what it is that you want us to do. As we, we come to you, Lord, let us, let us give with a purpose, knowing that the, the purpose is yoked to you, that the purpose originates with you, and the purpose will finish with you. We thank you and we praise you and we give you the glory for all of these things. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. amen. Please stand for the doxology. Center 12 step. Guys, I, I guys and gals, look, when I say guys, I just, I, it, it is a, uh, that means everybody. I'm tired of having to say guys. I mean guys and gals. And, you know, it's just people of the congregation. Um, we have uh, Overcomers Monday at 7 p.m. 
Chrysler 12 step, you know, one of the complaints that we always hear is that, uh, that, that the different meetings are not necessarily uh, too friendly to, to followers of Christ. Well, this is an opportunity for you to learn how to bring that into the meeting. This is literally a bridge um, that allows you to take the gospel into these meetings and, and share it. Because, you know, we were talking about, we talk about gifts and we talk about what we're going to put into God's kingdom. Well, one of the things that we're supposed to put into God's kingdom is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the life, the death, the resurrection, and the impending return of Jesus Christ. Those things we are called to share. It does not matter if you are a pastor. It does not matter if you are a brand new disciple. We are called to do that. It's called the Great Commission. Um, pastor Pete Tackett, he, uh, he, he used one of my favorite lines in one of his sermons. He said, it is the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. It is a commission of all people who know Christ to share Christ. So um, this meeting, not only do you, do you get the support that you need from your, uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ, it also teaches you to go into maybe a hostile environment and, and share Christ. Because, you know, we feel comfortable in a lot of places sharing Christ because we understand that it's Christ friendly. You know, we can all do that, right? But, but we're not necessarily called just to share Christ in the, in the places where it feels comfortable. Sometimes we're called to, to share Christ in the places that are uncomfortable. And um, it's amazing how much fruit can be bore um, in, in a place like that. So, uh, so Monday we have that. Tuesday is the uh, 4th of July, Independence Day. So, uh, you know, celebrate that for sure. Um, Without the freedoms that we have, we may not be here today. Uh, you know, there are people uh, people who are meeting in secret spots in China right now. So, uh, so definitely celebrate that. We don't have anything going on here on Tuesday. Wednesday we have uh, we have Holy Hump Day, and uh, we will be eating breakfast. We'll be eating breakfast. Yes. I love breakfast for dinner. Breakfast for dinner is like one of the greatest inventions of all time. Um, and it's, it's going to be good because we're all going to get our fill of, of hamburgers, hot dogs, barbecue, and everything else. So it will be nice to, to have some, some breakfast. I, I like that. Uh, men's group, we will be continuing to study the life of Joseph. Um, has that been helpful? Have you all been studying and reading? I mean, guys, you know... It's like we said, we took the, the macro, and now we're making it micro. Uh, you know, two chapters, and we've asked that y'all read the same two chapters over and over and over again this week, and, and why is that? Because, you know, so many times you hear people say, I read the Bible in a year. Okay, well, I've done that several times myself as well. But it's not as much how quickly you read the Bible as much as it is what you retain and what you're able to apply to your life. And, and what we're trying to do with, with this right now, with the life of Joseph, by reading the same two chapters daily, is we are trying to pick up everything that we can from Daniel's life so that we can apply it. And if you're doing the packets that come with it, it should be humbling and it should be eye-opening. I know that when I did my family tree and I realized that uh, my, my family tree, you know, I, it just asked about my side. It did not ask about my wife's side of the family, but my family tree... Now comprised is now comprised of myself, Mickey, and Sadie. Everyone else is gone. I have no more family tree. We are the tree. So, um, and I didn't even think about that until we were we were working through this. And uh, you know, so you know, it, your eyes will be open to a lot of things if you actually take it seriously and, and you do the work. Um, ladies, what are y'all discussing? We're gonna go over Psalm one forty five. Psalm one forty five. Can you recite it for us? No, no way. No way. She can. She can sing it. She's just humble. Um, Thursday, the high set ladies are back. That is from 5 to 7.30. So if the Lord's laid it on your heart to continue your education, by all means, come on. And you know what? I know that there are a lot of people here that, uh, that, that need that high school diploma. Um, guys, the two years of college that come with it are invaluable. Um, but a lot of times we don't like to admit that we need things. 
for fear of, uh, of being mocked, for fear of, of embarrassment, whatever it may be. The fact of the matter is, your life circumstance is your life circumstance. You know, if someone's going to make fun of you because of your life circumstance, do you really need them in your life, A? And two, um, it's not on them, it's on you to do something about it. So, um, you have the opportunity, there is no charge for it. Um, it takes, ever how long it takes, they're going to come in, you'll come in, um, they will give you a pretest to see where you stand and all the different uh, disciplines that you'll be tested on. And from there, they will figure out how they can help you and they will get you to the level that you need to be so that you can not only pass the test, but you, you will truly be prepared to excel at the next level. So um, I'm telling you, education is a gift, a gift. Um, Saturday, we have the laundry ministry at noon. Um, it's going to be at the laundromat across from Ole Guacamole. Uh, little plug for them. Man, top notch. If after the laundry ministry, y'all want some good Mexican food, go there. Um, they're not there no more. They're not there no more. Oh, they're going to move out to uh, where uh, Bay Boys are, and that's Trip Center. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, they're moving on up like the Jeffersons. That's right. Praise God. They've been blessed. So they go to the north side. Yeah. Well, it used to be a good Mexican restaurant. <laughs> but now, it's just an empty building. And if you want to go over there and cook Mexican food... I'm sure the equipment's there. Well, the equipment's probably there. you got to be quick, though. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be quick. Uh, fleet of foot. Uh, you won't see me over there. You know, because um, I, I, my days are running are over. Um, but anyway... And then, uh, then on Sunday, we will be right back here for service and, uh, you know, in receiving God's word and hopefully applying it to our lives. So that is what we have going on this week. I encourage y'all to, uh, to seriously consider taking part in something like that. Or here's the other thing about it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of places that you go and, um, Pastors are afraid of, of people opening or starting ministries because they feel like it's a threat to their job. Um, if you want this job, come get it, first off. Um, I was called here, so, you know, until my calling is up, you won't be able to get it. But the other thing is, we've been, been called to train people in ministry. So if you have something on your heart, let's say that you have a life experience that you feel like needs to be addressed. You feel like other people are suffering from something that you've suffered through. It's a part of your testimony. It's part of what the Lord is, has, has built you for. Remember, we're talking about things that we can put back into to God's kingdom. Man, bring that ministry to us, and we will help you do it. We won't do it for you. That's been laid on your heart. Uh, another little plug, Reverend Latney. How many of y'all know Reverend Latney? Reverend Latney is a good dude. He do, but he doesn't mince words. He doesn't mince words at all. Um, I'd spoken at their church, and uh, I'm standing there, I'm talking to Reverend Latney, and this guy comes up and he says, Reverend Latney, you know, the Lord's really laid it on my heart that you need to blood, you know, and he, he, he spouts out this whole ministry. And Reverend Latney said, You know what? I will support you, but I'm not doing anything. That was laid on your heart, not my heart. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, you know, that, that, that's what it is. That, that's, that's laid on your heart. It's my job to assist you, but it's not my job to do that. I've got, I've got enough on my plate, and uh, I'll be glad to help and assist any way we can. But, uh, but the Lord is calling you to a ministry in some shape, manner, and form. Again, uh, you know, it, it's amazing the, the continuity that we have going on right now in the spirit in this church because... Uh, Ricky will hit on certain things during praise and worship or in a sermon or, or, or whatever and, uh, and it's, 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 it ties in perfectly and we, and we don't discuss what we're going to, to talk about, we don't discuss what he's going to sing, as a matter of fact people ask me all the time things about praise and worship not only you know what songs but also they ask me can I, can I come and, and play with the praise band or whatever and I'm like look I don't do praise and worship <laughs> that, is, that is Ricky and Nikki's ministry and uh uh, Shirley and, and Katie and, and Lydia and, and that's that's their ministry. That's not my ministry. If you uh, want to go talk to them, 
feel free. But uh, I'm not going to put you on stage and put them in a bad spot. And uh, I'm not going to volunteer them to sing a song that I don't even know if they know or not. So um, we don't discuss it. We, but but it's, it's amazing how the Lord manages to harmonize um, what we what we talk about. Uh, a couple things that I want you to keep in mind as we, we go through this sermon today is, number one, I, I, I want you to, to focus on what you're following. Okay, what are you following in your life? Think about that. What are you following? Um, and then the other thing that I, I really want you to, to focus on is I want you to focus on... Um, the condition of your heart. Because the condition of our hearts is what the Lord is really looking at. The condition of our hearts is what, what God cares about. The condition of our hearts is, is where our relationship with the Lord really starts. You know, some of the worst advice that you will ever get, and you've heard me say it a million times, some of the worst advice that you'll ever get is follow your heart. Follow your heart will get you in places that you don't want to be. Because our hearts, in, inherently, the, inherently, Follow our desires. You know, if if we if we go and we follow our heart without prayer, without supplication, without thinking, what we do is we end up doing what we want to do, not what the Lord wants us to do. And I mean, seriously, think about it. And, and if you feel like I'm wrong, prove it. Okay. <laughs> but if we if we simply follow our hearts without any other type of of of, of you know thought. We, we put ourselves in bad spots. And, you know, part of that is because we've been given free will. Now, you know, free will is, you can call it a matter of semantics. You can call it whatever you want. I personally believe that you don't receive free will until you receive the Holy Spirit. Because until you receive the Holy Spirit, you don't have any will but your own will. So what's the freedom in that? You know, we're talking about freedom. We're talking about celebrating the freedoms that we have on the 4th. You know, do you, if you don't know Christ, you don't have freedom to do any other will than the will of your own. Now, your will sometimes may do something that the world considers good, and other times it may do something that the world considers bad. That's called freedom of choice. Freedom of choice and freedom of will are two different things. But once you receive the Holy Spirit, then you have the choice of doing your will or His will. Therefore, you actually have free will. Again, a matter of semantics. But I'm just telling you where I'm coming from and, 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 and how I look at that. Um, my entire sermon changed this morning. Uh, every day, you might notice how incredibly active I am on Facebook. Uh, I, I tell you, happy birthday, and I put a piece of scripture up. That's about all I do. Because uh, really, other than that, uh, it's a big rabbit hole where people's lives just seem to go down the toilet. Um, but... Uh, you know, my sermon changed today because uh, the, 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 the scripture that, uh, that I was instructed to put up today, and, and the scripture that I put up is uh, from Jeremiah chapter 17. And, uh, you know, it is, it is a great piece of scripture for exactly what we're talking about. I've got to give you a little bit of context. Jeremiah was a prophet during the time of the last five kings of Judah. So we are looking at the end of the time before Judah went into exile. Now in 722 BC, Israel had gone into exile. Israel was captured by the Assyrians and they were brought into a place of servitude by a nation um, and Judah was left. Now, the reason that Judah was left is because after the reign of Solomon, the kingdom split. The kingdom was split into two different nations. One was Israel. One was Judah. Judah was given as a concession because of the Davidic covenant. God had promised David that there would always be someone in his lineage to sit on the throne. So all of the kings of Judah were from the lineage of David. You cannot say that about the, the kings of Israel, but the kings of Judah were all from David's lineage. Some were good, some were bad. All the kings of Israel were bad. So that's just a little bit of context so that you know where we're coming from, okay? So here's Jeremiah 
And he's receiving word from God, and he is sharing it with the people. Remember when we were talking just a little bit ago about uh, going into a hostile environment and sharing the true word of God and sharing the gospel? Well, imagine how Jeremiah felt. Because Jeremiah is coming into a place where, at this point in time, Judah is actually enjoying a time of wealth. They're enjoying a time of prosperity. They're enjoying a time where, where they are, are, are receiving earthly riches. But here's Jeremiah. And Jeremiah's like, this ain't going to last for long. You better change your ways. You better get it right. It's not going to work. Well, in chapter 17, Jeremiah delivers the word of the Lord. And the Lord is pretty much telling Judah, it's done. Starting with verse 1, it says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altars. So the Lord is on this. That means that the Lord sees all things. The Lord knows that the heart of Judah is not going to change. That is why these metaphors, that's why these, these, these images are being brought forth. A pen of iron. So a pen of iron. Think about that. Think about how heavy that writing must be. It, with, a, with a point of a diamond. Hardest, the hardest substance on earth. You know, you can, you can cut glass with a diamond. So, so this is being engraved. There's, there's nothing that's going to change the heart of Judah at this point, and the Lord knows it. And it, it's written on their hearts. No matter what's happened, it's written on their hearts. Now, now the, the, the Israelites and the Judeans, they, they, they've seen and they've received all of these things from the Lord. Remember, the, the, it's not too long ago it's not too far removed, approximately 700, 800 years from the time in which Israel was released from slavery from the Egyptians. Not just released from slavery, they were released from slavery without a fight. The Egyptians just let them go. Their entire workforce, basically. They let them go. And not only did they let them go, they gave them all their stuff. <laughs> the Israelites plundered them on the way out without raising a sword. Then they come to the place where the Egyptians came to their senses and they chased them down. And there they are at the Red Sea. And I mean, surely this is going to be the end of the Israelites. Not because the Israelites didn't have the numbers. They actually had the numbers. That's what made them such an asset. To, to Egypt. They had the numbers, but they didn't have the weaponry. They didn't have the chariots. They didn't have the swords. They didn't have the spears. But here they are. They're trapped, and, and they've got the, 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 the pillar of smoke and the pillar of fire in between them and the Egyptians. And the Lord tells Moses, raise your staff, hit it on the ground, and the sea will part, and you will walk on dry land, but you must step. See, we always, we always like to tell that story, but, but we forget about the part where the Lord tells them, you must step and walk on dry land. In other words, the Lord's going to do a lot of things in your life. He's going to do a lot of things in my life. He's going to do a lot of things throughout. But we got to step. We got to do some work. We got to do some movements. We see that's what's happened to Judah at this point. Judah's received all these blessings from the Lord, but they're not stepping. They're not acknowledging that God is the one that has given them all these things. They've got all these earthly riches, yet they have not acknowledged God. Instead, instead, they have been worshiping idols. They've been worshiping false gods, the false gods of the nations around them. You know, we look at the Mosaic Law and we think that, man, how stupid is this? It, it, it wasn't stupid. It was symbolic. It was symbolic. The ceremonial laws of, of Moses are symbolic. They're symbolic of how God wanted the Israelites to be set apart from all the other nations. He didn't want them to be a cookie-cutter nation. He wanted them to be recognized as a nation of God. 
He wanted them to be recognized as a people that were dedicated to God. So it says in the very next verse, it says, While their children remember their altars and their ashram beside every green tree on high hills, on the mountaintops, in the open country. That is a direct contradiction of what he asked them to do in Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, he says, Teach your children these things diligently. Diligently teach them the ways of God. Diligently remind them about how I brought you out of slavery. Diligently let them know about me. Diligently teach them going in, going out. When they're awake, when they're asleep, when they're sitting, when they're standing, at all times, let your children know about me. But the Israelites, the Judeans at this time, have failed miserably. Their children don't remember God. Their children remember the poles of Asherah. They remember the Baals. They remember the false gods. They remember Moloch. They remember all of these, these false deities that, that have been put before them. Now, a lot of times, a lot of times people say, well, how did this happen? Well, part of it happened because when Joshua was, was commissioned to clear everyone out, he left pockets of Canaanites, pockets of, of Amorites, pockets of different peoples within the, the, what, what God wanted to be holy and set apart. And then the other way that it happened was part of the reason that the kingdom got divided. Solomon brought a lot of nations in there. Now, not just through trade and commerce, okay? You, you know, that just comes with it. You know, sometimes we have to trade with, with, with other nations around us. But we don't have to, to bring in their traditions and we don't have to bring in their gods. And that's what was happening. You know, one of the first things that it says about Solomon was that he married the daughter of Pharaoh. The very nation... That, 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 that Israel was released from slavery from, Solomon's like, well, I think that we should, we should, we should bring a relationship back in with them. And, and, and what Solomon would do is Solomon would marry these women from all these nations, 700 wives. Talk about a man that was tired. <laughs> my gosh. Oh, my goodness. No, it's not okay, okay. Look, it's, ladies, if you had 700 husbands, you'd be tired too. Probably more tired than we are with 700 wives. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying marriage is difficult. All right? It, marriage is marriage takes work. I can't imagine that work times 700. So Solomon brings in all these wives, and most of them are coming from foreign nations. And, and, and Solomon, in his mind, is thinking, I'm doing this so that we don't have trouble, right? He's relying on his own understanding, not the understanding of God. God's already told him, I don't want these false gods in the country, in the, the nation that I've set apart. What I want is I want you to be mine. But Solomon's thinking, in order for us to get everything that we want, in order for us to get all these wonderful things in the world, I mean, they got so rich that silver was considered to be worth nothing. Isn't that crazy? There was so much gold, so much silver, so much bronze, that it was just, it wasn't worth a thing. So Solomon accomplished that, but what Solomon would do is he'd bring in and he'd marry these daughters from all these foreign nations, and then he would set up altars for them, and he would set up places for them to worship their gods. And what ended up happening is he himself started worshiping these gods. He fell away. We read it in the book of Lamentations, where he finally comes back to his senses because Solomon was a very wise man. He was. And it, and it says, you know, all of that is vanity. Anything that's not of God is vanity. So he comes to his senses. But, but, but just like Solomon, the other people start worshiping these false gods also. So Israel had gotten to a point where they, just, they, they, they were just worshiping so much that God had to move. Their children didn't even know what the real true God looked like. And, and it's, it may not have even been that they weren't telling them about God in a sense. 
but they weren't telling about the one true God. And, and think about today, you know, we want to relate that to today, right? Think about the things of, of, of pluralism, you know, that, that every God is the same. There's only one heaven. There's many ways there. God looks different to all people. Well, you know what? God may look a little different to me than he does to you, but it doesn't change the, 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 the deity and the, the, the person of God, right? There's one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's not called by many names. He's not called by Buddha. He's not called by, by, by Allah. He's not called by Siddhartha. He's not called by anything other than God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you know, Jehovah, he is, he is our God. That is the God. So it says, it says, your wealth and all your treasures I will give as spoil as for the, the, the price of your high places for sin throughout your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know, for my anger is a fire. Kindled that shall burn forever. So he's saying, look, I've given you everything that you've got. I know that we're, we're going into a lot of context here. But without context, you're not going to understand what, what Jeremiah is talking about. You're not going to understand what the Lord is laying on his heart. See, the people understand this because they would have definitely understood these covenants. They would have definitely understood what they were in violation of. Right? So, so the covenant, let's look at the, the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant was the covenant in which God promised to give Abraham seed and land. We've talked about this before also. Hopefully you remember that. Abrahamic covenant, seed and land. He tells them, I will give you a people as numerous as the stars, as numerous as the sands. Okay? So we see that, that Israel is a huge country, right? They've gone in captivity, now it's Judah. Still pretty large. And he says, I'll give you land. Well, most of that land's been taken by the Assyrians, but then there's that patch of Judah, which still remains. It's kind of like what Israel is today, because Israel is just a fraction of what God gave them at this very moment. But he's saying, you have violated the covenant that we made, because that was his part. I will give you land and I will give you seed. But in return, what he asked of the people, and what the people said they would do is, you will be our God and we will be your people. As a matter of fact, God put it in his terms. He said, I will be your God and you will be my people. As they gathered around the mountain, and then they all shook and said, Moses, you talk to us from now on because God scares us. Okay, so that's where we're at. That's where we're at. God is telling them, look, I see your heart. On your heart, it's not my name. It's not my name written with the point of the diamond. It's not my heart written with the lead pen. It's not, it's not my name that's written on your heart. It, it's the heart of, of all of these other false gods. And it's the heart, it, it's the name of, of all these riches. So what I'm going to do, no matter how hard you try to hang on to it, is I'm going to rip these things from your hand, and I'm going to remove you from the place that I gave you. Because when they came into that land, if you remember our Bible study, it said that, that, that as they came into the land, they were fighting peoples more numerous and more powerful than them. There is no other reason that the Israelites should have ever been able to conquer that land other than God. We've all got something like that in our lives. There is, there is many things in my life that I have accomplished, that I have been able to do, that there is no other explanation other than God. Amen. And I feel like everyone has that. Everyone has that because God reveals himself to us in those times where we feel defeated and where we feel like it's hopeless. And that's where those strong bonds and relationships are. Now, it says that, uh, that, that he, his, his, his anger is a fire kindled that shall burn forever. And I just want to just touch on that one second. What about grace? 
There's the question, right? What about grace? God of the Old Testament, God of vengeance, God of the New Testament, God of grace, right? Nope, same God. Same God. He showed grace to, to Israel so many times. So many times. What does it take for us to receive the grace of God? Faith. Faith. Boom. Faith. You are saved by grace through faith. You are saved by your faith in God, therefore he gives you grace. They had no faith. They had no faith that God could get them through whatever it was that they were struggling with. As a matter of fact, they were, they were surrounded by all of these, this fighting and this, 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 these wars. 701, 609, they aligned themselves with the Egyptians of all people to help them defeat their enemies. They didn't rely on God. They didn't hit their knees and pray and rip their clothes and cover themselves in ashes and say, Lord, we are coming to you, a broken and repentant people. We need you to put up walls. We need you to defend us. We need you, Lord. We need you. No, what they did was they pulled out their cell phones and they called the Egyptians. <laughs> they didn't have cell phones. <laughs> They didn't have cell phones. But they, they, they reached out to the Egyptians instead of reaching out to God. They were a faithless people. So that should give us a clue as to what God is looking at us like if we are depending on other things than God to get us through the times that we are struggling with, the times that we are facing. See, it's the same God. That's why we can learn from Old and New Testament. If you are a New Testament disciple and you don't ever crack open the Old Testament, you are half a disciple because you have to know it all. You have to recognize all of it. In order to, to know Jesus, you've got to be able to understand this Old Testament. So then it says, Thus the Lord says, Curses the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Without the Lord in our lives, we are incomplete. But there is an innate need for us, for, for mankind, and this innate need was placed there by God to know and to understand where we come from. And in order to gain that true understanding, we have to know God. We have to know Christ. The only way to the Father is through the Son. The only way to receive the Spirit is through the Son. Amen. Jesus is the jumping off point for our understanding. Look, I understand science. I get science. I will not say that science is not real. I will say that a bunch of the pseudoscience floating around is a load of crap. Mm -hmm. I'll say that a lot of the things that I used to believe before I knew Christ have proven to be not only untrue, but illogical once I really looked at them. Look around this building right here. Do you really believe that we all came from a primordial slime? Come on now. When was the last time you saw one thing become another in nature? Yeah, we're going to hold up evolution like it's a, a mighty truth. I'll tell you this right now. If you're a person of color and you follow Darwinism... You need to study a little bit more because he said that Africans and Aborigines were, were uh, that they needed to be eradicated. Know what you follow, folks. I'm not going to follow something that says I need to be eradicated. I'm not. I don't, I don't want to be eradicated. I want to leave this earth eventually, but I don't want to be eradicated because I'm considered to be less than. What kind of science is that? See, when 
we come to know Christ, we gain logic, we gain understanding, we gain the ability to use our entire mind. Before Christ, we use part of our mind and we rely on man to explain the things of the world to us. Man is a part of that creation. As a part of that creation, I can't tell you how it was created. As a matter of fact, I know that God spoke it into existence, right? I read that in the first chapter of the Bible. But how he did it, I'm going to be honest. He's God, I don't know. I know it happens. And I know it makes a lot more sense than the alternative option. See, but if I allow man to control my thoughts, if I trust man, then not only am I going to believe in that, I'm going to be able to justify just about anything that I do in my life because man can't agree on anything. There is no consistency in the thought of man. If you want consistency, you've got to look to God. God is consistent. The very same things that he said at the beginning of the Bible that were wrong are the same things that he says at the end of the Bible that were wrong. Amen. You want to do a little fun exercise looking at this? Take the first three chapters of Genesis and then read the last four chapters of Revelation. Do it together. Read those three, then those four, and you're going to be like, oh my gosh. There it is. There it is. And, and, and the thing is, he, he, he describes us as a, a shrub in the desert, an uninhabited salt land. So, so we're not even receiving the nourishment that we need. All that we're doing is we're just pumping ourselves full of, 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 of false uh, riboflavin. That's what we're filling ourselves with is riboflavin. <laughs> I love riboflavin because it keeps my cereal crunchy. <laughs> but I need more than riboflavin. I need proteins. I need carbohydrates. Could probably cut down on the fats a little bit, but you know what? Those days are over. I go to the gym so I can eat what I want to. <laughs> yeah. But we need other things, you know. So if we need full nourishment, we've got to turn to the Lord. And he goes on and he says, blessed is the man, this is verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. So not only do I trust in the Lord, the Lord is where my trust originates. As a pastor, I see a lot of people, a whole bunch of people, all the time. And I've told you that I can't look at your heart. I can't. But I tell you what, the Lord has given me some discernment. And sometimes I will shake hands with a person and I'm like, ugh. Mm -hmm. I'm being dead serious. And that's the Lord telling me something. I trust in what the Lord tells me. I look at scripture and I hold it as 100% as, as truth. I look at God's word and there is, there is nothing in his word, one, that contradicts. And number two, there is nothing in his word that, that I would exchange for a false truth of man. My trust is God. That's where my trust originates. If it's not of God, I'm not going to trust it. And that's not just because I am a pastor. It's not just because I, I, I'm, I'm holier than thou. It's not because of anything other than one, God has shown me that he will never, ever, ever lead me astray. And then number two is pure empirical knowledge. Empirical knowledge is tied to your five senses. And through my five senses and my time on this earth, I've learned that man will deceive all five of them. So God is our trust. God is who we should trust. And he says in verse 8, he is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes for its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought. 
for it does not cease to or it does not cease to bear fruit. Oh, there it is again, Ricky. Bearing fruit. When you come to know the Lord, you don't have to worry about that season of drought. You don't have to worry about that dry time. You don't have to worry about it. Now, it is human nature to worry about things. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, I'm not saying this. I'm not saying quit your job, go to your house, put all your bills in a pile and say, Lord, pay these. <laughs> Lord, pay them. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. I'm not saying when you're sick to not go see a doctor. I'm just saying, Lord, heal me. Lord, heal me. Because you know what? God has given that doctor the ability to diagnose and to treat ailments. A lot of times you're being healed by the Lord through the hands of that doctor. We have to understand these things. You know what I'm saying? We get a little extreme with these things sometimes. A little extreme. We were talking about an old joke, and I'm sure some of y'all have heard it, but there was this guy who was sitting in a flood, and he's sitting on top of his roof, and he's watching this water rise. This first boat comes by and says, hop on the boat. God's like, no. God's going to get me. God's going to save me. God's like, all right. And just goes on down. Water's rising up a little bit more. Second boat comes. He says, no. God's going to save me. God's going to get me. I'm going to make it through this flood. So now the water's up to his knees. And the helicopter flies over and drops a line down. He says, no, no, God's going to save me. God's going to bring me out of this. Well, the guy drowns. And he's standing before the Lord. And he said, Lord, why didn't you save me? He said, what are you talking about? I sent two boats in a helicopter. <laughs> See, we got to move. The blessings are there, but we got to move. And we have to understand that, that sometimes blessings come from God through other people. We can't just sit there and, 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 and pray it away. We'll pray and God will put a solution in front of us. But we don't have to worry and we don't have to stress about it either. When we, when we have a relationship with God, we can get to that place of peace. We talk about it all the time. You, you, your, your peace will let you know when you are in the will of the Lord. You know, I'll go back to that sickness example. You know, pray about the doctor you go see. One of the first things that I ask any doctor that's going to do any type of work on me is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? If the answer is no, I will ask for another doctor. And I don't even say no offense. Because if they take offense, good. <laughs> so it, it, it's not, it's not, that we can't receive those blessings through the people that, that God has ordained, but we have to seek God and we have to move in these things, but we don't need to worry and we don't need to be stressed out. We know that God will, will, will take care of us, but we have to diligently seek him for the answers and we have to diligently seek him so that we can receive what we need to. And in doing so, we will be able to bear the fruit that we've been ordained to bear, whether it be 100, whether it be 60, whether it be 30, whatever it may be. And verse 9 is one of the best lines out there, one of the best things that, uh, that supports my argument that I put forth at the very beginning. It says, the, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The Lord understands it. The Lord understands our hearts. He understands our minds. He understands our hearts. Our, our everything. And it says, The Lord, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his way, according to the fruit of his deeds. So when we seek that peace and when we seek the Lord in our, in our decision making, it is pleasing to him. But also understand that we're going to make mistakes and that's when we come with a repentant heart. 
That was part of the problem that Judah was facing right here was there was no repentant heart. There was no acknowledgement of God. There was, there was no apology because they didn't think that they were doing wrong because they were doing what their heart said, not what the Lord said. Verse 11, it goes on to say, like a partridge that gathers a, a, a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days, they will leave him, and at his end, he will be a fool. This is going to shoot down the karma thing for you. Also, the law of retribution. See, is if we look at the book of Job, it's all about the law of retribution. You know, here's Job. He's like, my goodness, all these bad things have happened to him. But he's remaining faithful. He's remaining faithful knowing that, that, that no matter what happens, God will see him through it. And, and whether he dies, whether he lives, he will be with the Lord and he will be made whole. Right? Well, Job's friends are coming and they're like, well, you had to do something. I mean, this just doesn't happen to everybody. You had to do something. And Job's like, no, I didn't do anything. This is just, this is basically just, you know, kind of what happens in life. And everyone thinks that there was a deal struck with, with Satan that is not, you know, there today. No, Satan still messes with the very same things that he messes with with Job, just so you know. All those things Satan can still mess with. Satan, this earth, this is where this is Satan's playground. This is his last hurrah. This is his last chance to do anything. I know how the book ends. And he's going to go down kicking and screaming, and he's going to take as many of, 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 of us down with him that he can. But those who remain faithful, those that, that know Christ, understand that there is something better, no matter how bad the situation may be. Now, what, what this is saying, though, is this is saying that, 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 and this is where it shoots down karma, guess what? There's a lot of bad, rich people out there. Did y'all know that? Okay. So the rich are not rich because they're good. In all instances. There's some good rich people too. There's a lot of good poor people. But this is saying, those who, who go out and gather riches of the world without God, those who go out and gather riches in the world according to their hearts, and according to the flesh, they will be put to shame. In the end, they will be fools. See, part of one of the worst, one of the worst things about hell to me is the fact that before someone goes to hell, they're going to see Christ. See, hell is a place of, of eternal torment. Talk about torment. You spend all your time on earth here worrying about yourself, worrying about your flesh, worrying about what your heart wants you to do, everything else, telling everyone that God is just the invisible man in the sky. You're a fool for believing in that, this, that, and the other. Then the day comes and you, know, you, you get struck by a car or you fall off a boat, whatever it may be. Yeah, rich people have boats. That's why I said that. <laughs> fall off a boat, drown. And then the eternal is like that. So there's no waiting period. No waiting room. You're standing before Christ. And you're like, you're not real. He's like, oh, you're about to see how real I am. I don't know you. Doesn't matter how many newspapers you were in. Doesn't matter how often you were on the news. It doesn't matter how many, many, many charities you gave to. I don't know you. Your heart was not with me. Your heart was with yourself. Therefore, you're going to spend the rest of eternity as a fool. In eternal torment. So, I'm going to finish out the the. the, the the, the verses here, 12 and 13, it says, A glorious throne set on high from the beginning, 
is the place of our sanctuary. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. We are not Israel. I feel like I have to say that all the time. I actually had someone say that to me again the other day. They said, we are Israel. I said, no, we're not. I'm Irish. You see my 23 of me? I'm Irish. I'm not Israel. Neither are you. We're Gentiles. But through God's grace and through God's mercy, we were grafted into the promises that were given to Israel. So this is as real to us as it is to, to, to them. Okay? Number one, it says a glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. We go to Revelation and it says the dwelling place of man is with God. And God will dwell with man. There is a day where we will dwell with God in the place of his throne. And that throne has been there since the beginning of time. So therefore, if you know Christ, that is where you will be. You will be with God. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? But if you're following your heart, now, look, that's the whole point of this. That, the, the, the question that I asked at the beginning is, what are you following? If it's your heart, have at it. I would think about it. I would ponder about it. I would seek diligently to see if there's something maybe better that you should follow. But if you it wind up saying, you know what that pastor is for, that, that book that he reads from, it's nothing but imaginary tales. Okay. I've done my part. Yeah. My job is to share it. My job is not to make you believe it. <coughs> if you believe it because of me, it's not real belief anyway. But, it says, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. There is no heaven for those that forsake God. The earth was their reward. That was it. It doesn't get any better than this, folks. If you were just following your heart, and your heart is not yoked to Christ, this is it. This is it. See, because verse 10 explains it all to us. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. Heart, mind, spirit, all have to be aligned with Christ. When you go to follow your heart, use your mind. Feel it in your soul. See if you get that peace. And if you don't get that peace, don't follow your heart until you find that peace. It's no rush. It's no rush. And as for man and as for their opinions, who cares? I'm serious. Who cares? Because the thing about man is I can find a group of, of people Right? Because when I say man, I mean mankind. Okay? Man and woman. And if they don't like what I'm saying, or they don't like what I'm doing, all I have to do is probably move over about four feet, and I've got a group over here that does like what I'm saying. And then here's the other thing about it. If everyone is happy all the time at what you're saying and what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. I'm not saying go out and make everyone angry, you know, intentionally, but... The word of God makes some people angry. So if everyone's happy every time you speak, you're doing it wrong. Embrace the fact that some people are unhappy. Can you think of any, any time in, in the Bible, and I'll close with this, any time in the life of Christ that he left the place and everyone was happy? Think about it. No, it was always a mixed bag. There was always a group of people that were happy and always a group of people that were extremely unhappy. It 
So our lives will mirror that if we're doing it properly. So as we close, two things for this week. One, figure out what it is that you're following. Are you following your heart? Are you following Christ? I mean, there's a third option. You could just be following everyone else, which is even more scary. And then the second thing is, let's quit worrying about what everyone thinks so much and just do what we're supposed to do. The rest will hash itself out. I like the ending. The ending is beautiful. So let's work towards that end. Bearing as much fruit as possible. Y'all did? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Well, um, if someone could bring me the prayer requests, we'll go over prayer requests. I want everyone to remember these prayer requests. Or th at least think about them. Um, when I'm done with them, if uh, I'll put them here. If someone could grab them and put them back up on that front table. When you come into the church this week, take a look at that prayer list and pray for the people on it. Because... Guys, we need, to, we need to be unified in prayer. Paul uses a term that, you know, so many times in his writings, and it's called like-mindedness. You know, like-mindedness comes from, from people that, uh, that, that are yoked in Christ, and, uh, and, and we have to be like-minded in prayer. So, um, be in prayer for Kenny. He has a tumor on his lung. Be in prayer for uh, Jackson Overstreet. Be in prayer for uh, Cameron Malone. Be in prayer for uh, Matthew Brocious and family. John Little and his family. Charlie Oaks and his family. Be in prayer for our youth. Yes, be in prayer for our youth. And I'll tell you what. I love seeing not just Sadie, but all of our kids dancing and, and enjoying praise and worship. You know what? If We should be like that, guys. We should. Man, I mean, when we when we start praising the Lord, we should we should be overcome with the Spirit in such a way that it's impossible for us to sit still. Um, be in prayer for uh, David Craddock uh, for healing in his family, all who are struggling with addiction, unspoken prayer. Be in prayer for Tim, Timmy's family, for Tyler Ebb, uh, his son Abel is getting a uh, MRI done tomorrow. We'll definitely be in prayer. Um, be in prayer for Kayana. Did I say that right? Kayana. Kayana. Okay. Kayana. I was close. I was close. And, uh, and Kimora. I got that one right. And uh, Kimora Davis. Be in prayer for JD. Uh, he has injured his shoulder. What would you do to your shoulder? I have no idea. It's called age, brother. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. Be in prayer for Pastor Scott Stephanie and the you know, right? shoulder. Golf swing. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah, absolutely. His golf swing. Be in prayer for all of it. Especially that golf swing. Oh, uh, be in prayer for uh, Athena, Debbie, Penny, uh, Shirley and Craig, me and Nikki, um, for Carrie, Rachel, Unspoken, uh, their kids, the homeless, and uh, all of the 180 people. Um, I tell you what, the 180 folks are doing a great job. Mm -hmm. They really yeah, are. are yeah. Yes, yeah. they are. They are. Um, always room for improvement. And that doesn't, that doesn't just go for participants, that goes for leadership as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I know that we could improve and uh, we strive to do it. If there's something that we could do better, please let us know. But that's the prayer request. Uh, these will go up front. Yes, ma'am. Pray for Diana. Diana, yes. Be in prayer for Diana. My one month old. And yes, be in prayer for Dylan's one month old. And um, you guys graduating next week. I'm sorry. You guys graduating. Yeah, be be in prayer for the guys graduating next week. Uh, that's gonna be a good time. It's gonna be a good time. Big time. Big time. Because uh, they are going to do wonderful things. I've, I've got uh, a lot of confidence in both of those individuals. One of them, though, uh, needs to make sure that no one's going in there and messing with his pillow. <laughs> <laughs> those that have seen the movie understand. Uh, so, all right, let's close out with a word of prayer. 
Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day, and Lord, I thank you for the time that we've been able to spend together, Lord. I pray that uh, as we, we, we leave here today, that we do take these things to heart, understanding that, that our hearts must be first yoked to you. Following our hearts is not going to get us anywhere, and that, uh, that the people of the world will always try to tear us down. Lord, we pray that we, uh, that we honor you with our lives and with, and with our words and, and with all that we do. I also pray that uh, if there's anyone here that has come to know you, that they, they seek you diligently, Lord, and that they, they receive you, understanding that you came to this earth and that you were punished for, for, for things that you, you didn't do, sent to a criminal's cross, spilling blood, but the blood that you spilled it atones for our sins, past, present, and future. It washes us clean, Lord. Let us be washed by your blood. Uh, from there, you were put into a borrowed grave where you resurrected after three days, guaranteeing us eternal life with you, with the Father, with the Spirit, and, and allowing us to, to have power over the things that we, we, we feel helpless over. Lord, you eventually ascended into the heavens to sit on the right hand side of your father as our advocate speaking for us when, when we're, we're, we're under, indefensible yet through you we have gained salvation you have become our justification and you wait eagerly to the day where you shall return and bring your people home to be with you Lord, we give ourselves to you, mind, heart, body, spirit, and soul, knowing that you are our salvation, that you are our healing, that you are our rest, and that you are our Savior. We thank you. As we go out this week, protect us, watch over us, allow us to do the work that you have ordained for us until we meet again. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen. amen.